Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Could we, could we do a, a quick uh, sound check? Uh, yeah, we're hearing you okay right now. Okay. Well, um, yeah, good morning. I'm Genzen Ed Cadman. I'm happy to be with you all in this Dharma connection from afar. I'm sitting at my desk in my apartment in Seattle, and I have some notes here on my iPad, which is just right here in front of me. So if you see me looking down, I'll be looking at the notes. Yeah, through the technology of Zoom and science, I can speak to you now from the uh, beloved Zendo of Sonoma Mountain Zen Center again, Joe G. And here in my apartment, I also have a small yet beloved Zendo, my peaceful abode here. And in this talk, I hope to share with you all, especially those who are, who are new to Sonoma Mountain and its world of Zen, a picture into my own joy of Zen as it was and is nurtured by my steady visits to Genjoji over the years. Today, I will share with you how I was deeply educated into Zen wisdom from my visits and being on the mountain. Especially, I'll refer to a work by our Soto Zen founder, Eihei Dogen Zenji, in his fascicle entitled The Mountains and Waters Sutra. So I, I first visited Sonoma Mountain Zen Center in February of 2006. I was 59 years old. I had practiced Zen in Seattle, my home, since 1992. And I learned about the existence of Sonoma Mountain from a lucky random search uh, at the Seattle Public Library where I found Kwang Roshi's series of talks uh, entitled Breath Sweeps Mind. It was like a big case with eight or nine cassette tapes in it. Here's what it looks like in the uh, DVD version with Roshi's great calligraphy on the front. And as uh, Roshi spoke to me on the, on the cassette tapes, his voice enchanted me with its expression of awe and wisdom and, and humor. I had listened to Zen teachers uh, before speaking in very serious tones. Um, and Kwong Roshi conveyed the seriousness, but also a delight. And I thought, oh, oh. So that was what impelled me to um, come to Sonoma Mountain. Also, I uh, wanted to do a session, and I had that February time open. Because at the conclusion of that uh, tape, uh, Kwang Roshi addresses his listeners uh, and, and invites them all to come. And... Um, so there I was, arriving in the third week of a four-week practice period, which is called the Ango, the winter Ango of 2006. And uh, uh, on our uh, Zoom broadcast, the Shuso of that Ango is here present, uh, Tenzan Chuck Ramey. So I was accustomed to participating in Sashin at my home temple in Seattle, but Sonoma Mountain was so intimate. I was fascinated to be in the remoteness of the place and the land, even though we sitting in the Zendo could hear cars passing on the road and planes flying overhead and occasionally bicyclists chatting to each other as they traveled down Sonoma Mountain Road. 
And we could hear the wind in the trees outside and the wild birds and across the road, the domestic chickens of the farm there. I saw wild turkeys trotting by through the grasses. And I had the feeling I was in ancient Japan. Only I was in California. <laughs> um, and I began flying down for more a practice because of this experience. And I returned the next February of 2007 for the week of Sashin. And then nearly every February thereafter until the pandemic. I also began coming down to attend the week of Sashin called Rohatsu, the week of practice held during the first week of December that celebrates the historical Buddha's enlightenment experience. The Rohatsu Sashin had a unique event compared to any other retreat I'd ever attended. On the last evening of the practice week, a Friday evening, uh, beginning at midnight and going into early Saturday morning, we would all sit together in one long go, midnight to 4 a.m., to experience what Buddha accomplished and physically to feel it for ourselves, sitting as Buddha once did on the early morning of his awakening, when he looked up at the morning star, the planet Venus meeting the first light of dawn and knew that he was interconnected with everything and that everything was interconnected with him, including us sitting here today, thousands of years later, and several summers, I came to the mountain to attend the whole four weeks of the summer practice period in, in August, the Ongo. And time in these summers seemed to drift in the August heat. Mm, I worked in the garden, my Samu practice, work practice, helping our head gardener in those days, Sally Scoville, with weeding and killing and watering. And today when I sit zazen here in my apartment, my journey continues wonderfully fortified by my Sonoma moments. Those days and weeks accompany me here in my daily practice. I can remember arriving at Genjoji in February, always being greeted by the spring air. This in Seattle, it's winter still in first of February. But uh, growing season at Sonoma Mountain was far ahead. I loved being received by the daffodils and uh, especially the quince. Already in late January in the garden is a good sized hedge of quince. Uh, rosy red blossoms thickly blooming on long branches or wands and several plants together in a hedge making an island of bright red. You don't see that in Seattle <laughs> first of February. You may see this hedge as you leave today. It's just at the edge of the uh, garden in the corner by the bamboo uh, trees, just near where the uh, Sonoma Mountain Zen Center sign is. The quince wands would also be the feature of each of the two vases on the Zendo altar. And I can see them here now. I love the altar flowers. Each vase is a different shape, different size, and it contains its own unique arrangement of flowers as if to reflect each of us in the Zendo and what we uniquely offer to the Buddha and Dharma and Sangha. Sometimes working in the garden, 
my wandering thoughts would ask, who, who, who planted this quince in the first place? Where does it come from? And looking at the altar, I would think, oh, oh, did the planter know that this would, this beautiful wand of blossoms would end up in a vase on the Buddha altar? This mystery now adorning the altar and uh, the hedge outside. Where did it come from? This kind of inquiry, inquiry was inspired my, by my thoughts from the daily reminder of gratefulness that we chant before eating our morning and midday meals. The chant that goes, 72 labors brought us this food. We should know how it comes to us. 72 labors is a, a Zen expression for infinite. Uh, we chant at meal to remember ourselves in the great and infinite unfolding of food production and life. From the produce department at Costco, back to the truck driver that brought the produce from the farm, to the farmer and all their families, and to the first time that seed was ever created that became the lettuce that we eventually ate. And in the Zendo, we could also wonder, 72 labors brought us this quince. We should know how it comes to us. Impossible to know with our logical, wondering minds the answer, but heartening to know this gift of food and red blossoms deeply connects us to this land where we come to practice and contemplate these mysteries, the same mysteries that uh, Buddha looked into. Practicing at Genjoji for years, visiting year after year is now the source of much gratitude as my daily zendo contains my home altar. And instead of a grove of redwoods just outside the zendo walls, I can look out from my second story window to a Douglas fir tree, which is about seven stories high. And it's a comfort and a guardian and holds the sunlight lightly in different shades as the hours pass by. And when I walk home from a walk out in the neighborhood on Seattle's Capitol Hill, just turning into my building's parking lot, I can see in the distance to the west, the buildings of Seattle descending down to meet Elliott Bay, the saltwater bay that's part of Puget Sound. And across the bay in the distance, the snow-capped Olympic Mountains, which if it's not cloudy, we'll usually be shimmering in sunlight. Yeah, I remember every season on Sonoma Mountain, quince and daffodils in February. The lawn and grass is all dried up in August. The heat so fierce for this Seattleite that I would wear a wet t-shirt under my robe to help me meet the afternoon heat. But on those summer nights of August, the darkness brought the illumination of the Milky Way. A stroll to the bathhouse after the last sit was awesome and solemn. Living here in Seattle, we, we never see the full display of stars in the clear night sky because of street lights are so prevalent. But pausing on Sonoma Mountain to look up to the stars or to the moon and the stars before turning in for sleep was really a, a near reflection of the peaceful hours of the August Zazen. Hmm. Once during a February session, I remember a wild storm so fierce that huge branches were torn off the trees. And the path down to the lower campus and bathhouse 
was blocked. And a day of sawing and clearing and dragging limbs to the burn pile accompanied the day and night of sitting in the zento. And I, I can remember that wonderful sound, the low click of the zendo furnace turning on when we're sitting in Chile Zazen. And went, oh, great. Another amazing gift of weather came for us once at a final all-night sitting of Rohatsu, which is called the Tetsuya. The four-hour continuous sit beginning at midnight for me was a, a time to sink into a deep and secure place, although extremely squirmy. Um, the saga included Roshi and Shinko, Hojo-san and Kashin, and my Dharma friends in residence for the week, and many folks who had driven up from their homes just to attend the gathering, to sit through and witness the night of Buddha's enlightenment. And as the hours advanced, so would my alertness retreat. But that night, through a, a, a storm raged outside all night long. The noise was so loud with the rain slamming against the Zendo roof in waves that it all, uh, we couldn't fall asleep if we wanted to. Another gift to us from the Buddha Dharma, from the night of his enlightenment. So makes me think 72 labors brought us this Tetsuya storm. We should know how it comes to us. Here we were, let's say, gathered on this slope in California, followers of the Buddha way, alert in practice together, safe and snug in an old barn, our beloved Zando. And for the February 2019 winter on go, I was chosen to be the Shu So, the head student, the same position that Chuck held uh, when I first attended in 2006. The Shuso was asked to choose a theme from some Dharma source to focus on in giving talks and readings throughout the four weeks of the Yango. Roshi had introduced us to the writings of Shohaku Okamura, Zen teacher originally from Japan, but now living and teaching in America. Okamura had just published a book examining a section of writing by Eihei Dogen, our Soto Zen ancestor, who lived from 1200 to 1253. And this book led us through each section of Dogen's Mountains and Water Sutra, which I believe was written in 1242. And as a, a, a part of his collection, the Shobogenzo, Okamura used the translation of Carl, Carl Bielefeld for his uh, examination. The sutra had 47 paragraphs, but I chose the very first line of the first paragraph to be the theme goes like this. These mountains and waters of the present are the expressions of the old Buddhas. These mountains and waters of the present are the expression of the old Buddhas. What is Dogen saying to us in these opening lines? which he continues to uh, explore in various images throughout. Is he declaring this mountain where you are sitting today, this morning, is an expression of the old Buddhas? Is he saying that the waters of rain that sprayed down on the Zender roof, uh, that Tetsuya, is an expression of the Buddhas? or the Buddha way. 
we chant in the fourth of our Bodhisattva vows, the Buddha way is unsurpassable. I vow to attain it. I vow to attain the Buddha way of rain, or I vow that Gens and Ed, this brief visitor to Sonoma Mountain, is an expression of the old Buddhas, or the Buddhas of past, present, and future. Dogen writes, uh, I came to realize clearly that mind is no other than mountains, rivers, and the great wide earth, the sun and the moon and the stars. And as we begin to read into the Mountains and Water Sutra, Dogen writes, the blue mountains are constantly walking. The blue mountains are constantly walking. What are these mountains? Could they possibly be we who are sitting here? Each of us a mountain, on the mountain, practicing together. The message of the old Buddhas is that we all are not separate skin bags, sparring with ego dramas of subject versus object. We are the blue mountains constantly walking. And today, this morning, we are indeed mountains on the mountain. When you arrived today, do, do you remember the freshness of the air and the light outside? Stepping onto the shoe platform, taking off your shoes, arranging them straightly with the others there, stepping into the zendo, offering a gasho, finding your place to sit for zazen. You were expressing the old Buddhas. Sitting zazen in the zendo, we nurture the mind of interconnection. As we settle into the feeling of our breathing, we breathe the same air as the redwoods outside and the light of the stars, and the wind that blows just outside the old barn walls. Our small minds merge into big mind. That wonderful phrase with Suzuki Roshi explains in Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. These mountains and waters of the present are the expression of the old Buddhas. And our sitting here is the practice of receptivity, of discovery. Even though we sit inside, we're not apart from outside. We're connected in emptiness in each passing and timeless moment. True, we sit inside the walls of a barn, and inside the walls of ourselves. I sit in the country of Ed. Chuck sits in the country of Chuck. And we just sit. Coming back to our breathing and our posture, we can slowly, slowly experience clear skies of no identity no duality, no separation, no suffering, which the mountains and waters continually demonstrate for us. The next line in the sutra is, each abiding in its own dharma state fulfills exhaustive virtues. Or each, each meaning each mountain and water. So each of us abiding in its own dharma state, in our own dharma experience, different from person to person, different from the person sitting next to us, different in our karmic history, in the conditions of our body and our personal resources, yet our practice is helping us abide 
in the Dharma. We're fulfilling exhausted virtues, the virtues of the Buddha way and what it teaches. Even if this is the very first time you've ever practiced Sazen, this dharmic state will resonate with you again and again. And this condition where practice and more practice helps us to become as quiet as the wind. We can release from our personal stories, our walls. Dogen once said, whoever told people that mind is thoughts, opinions, ideas, and concepts, mind means trees, fence posts, tiles, and grasses. Here's how Dogen ends his first paragraph. Since the virtues of the mountain are high and broad, the spiritual power to ride the clouds is always mastered from the mountains. And the marvelous ability to follow the wind is inevitably liberated from the mountains. Inevitably liberated. What confidence Dogen has in us and in the virtues of the Dharma. We sit in Zazen often, often mired in clouds, stormy thoughts, but we can ride the clouds mastered with the wind from the mountains. So as we say goodbye on this Saturday morning of community and riding the clouds and following the wind, may we all return to our homes safely. May our Zen practice continue to sustain us. And may we remember the mountains, the waters, wind and the stars of Sonoma Mountain. Zen Center, Genjoji. The mountains and waters remind us that we are all interconnected in the ecology of this life. The redwoods, their root systems, their home to the birds and the squirrels are purifying the air we breathe right now, the breathing we observe with our in breath and our out breath. Yep, one more memory that I hold so dearly from my experiences of Sonoma Mountain Zen Center. I think it's in the February Ango. We sit in the early morning and still dark. The first sit starts about 5 or 5.15 in the morning. And then there's one sit, can he, another sit, and then breakfast. It seemed like the beginning of the second sit. My thoughts would have eased, settle in just to the breathing and the darkness and the sendo. And suddenly I'd hear ooh, 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 ooh. And then a little more faintly, I'd hear. <laughs> and it would be owls outside in the early morning calling to each other. And the next February, I'd be surprised to get, oh, the owl, the owl's calling. And the first time I heard that owl, I had a little tear come down. Why? What, what touched my heart so much? Anyway, it, it, I've just been thinking maybe that's sort of like uh, the tear that Buddha may have received when he saw the morning star on that morning. Or, or uh, we all can remember a um, 
poignant moment in our practice lives. So the owl and uh, its hooting still sits inside of me. And when I'm sitting here at home, sometimes very foggy or distracted, and I, I can remember that experience. I remember it again and again, that place where I was so quiet and peaceful. So let me conclude with the wonderful final lines of the Mountains and Waters Sutra. And uh, I go like this. This is the 46th and the 47th paragraph. An old Buddha has said, mountains are mountains and waters are waters. These words do not say that mountains are mountains. They say that mountains are mountains. Therefore, we should thoroughly study these mountains. And when we thoroughly study the mountains, this is mountain training. Such mountains and waters themselves become wise persons and sages. So, best wishes for your mountain training, all you wise persons gathered here today. Thank you very much. <laughs>